Yeah, cool. So um, my name is Alan Boardman and I'm based in England and I bike pack more than I do anything else whatsoever. Um, it's it's really cool the way it sort of worked out is I've always been into bikes. Um, then I had a, about a year and a half off where I didn't do anything whatsoever and just kind of sat around and didn't really move. And then um, I was like, oh, I want to ride 100 miles in a day on my road bike. So picked it out, dusted it off, rode 100 miles after six weeks of trying to get up the strength to do it. And I was like, oh, I like that. And then it just kept on going and going. And then before I knew it, I was riding 200 miles in a day. So you start getting a bit bored of the road and want to do something a little bit different. So um, I was browsing uh, the internet and I seen this guy on um, on a bike with like deep section carbon wheels. And I was like, "Who? who, who's this guy? Because he's got bags all over it, but this super lightweight bike. And it was um, Mike Hall. Uh, Mike Hall was like a real inspirational bike packer who, super humble from Yorkshire, um, you know, like rode around the world in like record time and wanted to create something for people that couldn't just ride around the world. He wanted to do like something that he did within a holiday. So a two week race um, was formed called the Transcontinental Race. So that's why he had bags all over it because it was fully self supported. But I didn't know any of this. So I spoke to my friend. I was like, you've got bags on your bike. You know, what's all this about? And he and he told me. And um, I was like, I wouldn't mind some of that. So he's like, oh, well, I'll come around and have a beer. I'll loan you some stuff. And we'll go out and have a little camp out and see if you like it. I was like, yeah, all right, well, I'll I'll do that. And then, you know, I spent my first night in the stars, freezing cold because I had a terrible cold sleeping bag. It was horrendous. <laughs> but it was, it was such a little adventure. It was so good. And I was hooked from then. So, you know, fast forward a little bit of time and then you start playing out and doing a bit of bike packing on the weekend, you know, short, short things at first with like, you know, some beers involved, maybe whiskey, ice cream and such. And then it kind of spiral, spiraled from there because I was already into long distance riding. So I wanted to ride further. So I ended up um, sleeping to ride instead of riding to sleep. So if you if you um ride to sleep, you know, you only ride about ten miles and then you sleep and then you know marshmallows come out and you have a bit of fun. But if you want to ride longer, you're usually quite a long way away from somewhere where you can stay. So you chuck your tent up so you can sleep somewhere and then carry on riding the next day. Um and then like events like social events in the um in the UK in the Lake District, uh, there's one called Gen Ride. Which is like a, a a more it was at the time a more mountain biking, um, bike packing event over two days on a weekend, and um, taking in some of the biggest mountains and the lakes and just having a, a right load of fun. Um, but I done I I done my first gen ride in one go with no sleep and sub twenty four hours, and it kind of like clicked something in my head. So I was like, I I think I can push myself more than I'm giving myself credit for. So that's it. Kind of snowballed from there. So I, I still, I've, I always say I've got like two hats. I'll, I'll go out and I'll do a couple of miles and I'll sleep out and have a laugh and you know drink whiskey. But then there's other times where I just like load my bike up. I don't tell anyone what I'm doing. Then I'll go off and do something big, and then come back quite quite knackered and quite quite worn out from it. So it's it kind of like escalated from from there to be fair, and then. The bigger your rides get, the more you start looking to see how else you can challenge yourself. You know what? What else mm -hmm. can you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's like a common thing that I'm finding with all these different guests on here. Is it's just that that like mental aspect of how how much can you push your body? Like, I can't imagine running or biking or doing anything for 24 hours straight. But you know, after after hearing so many people do it, I feel like. The body is the body is able to the mind is strong enough. Um, yeah, so I you're the first bike packer I've really talked to, and I kind of have a, a general idea of what this is. I imagine it's the same as you know hiking, but all your gears on your bike, you get to travel a little bit quicker. Um, you know, 
easier and harder to do certain terrains. Is there anything special that you need to carry on this? Is there anything that you want to share just to like ground me on bikepacking? Um, well, a lot of the stuff I would say is quite similar to like likes of a through hike. You know, you're not going to mm-hmm. take the biggest kit. You're going to take the smallest kit that you can because you're only going to be putting it in one bag on your back. So that could, you know, it, it depends on the size of the backpack, but you could you could have like 40, 50, 60, 80 litre rucksack on your back and you've got all of this stuff. I think a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that you use for through hikes and such like that, you can basically use on bikepacking. It just goes into a smaller bag and then you've got to spend a long time figuring out what's important like, do you really need that extra pair of jeans? No, you definitely don't. You need, you need maybe a padded short at, at most. <laughs> so it's all all about um, just trying to minimize it as much as you can for you, your needs. Some people go out with hardly anything, um, you know, and, and win big races. And then there's other people that go out with a little bit more stuff. But it's, there's a lot of crossover from, from backpacking for sure. Is there anything unique with these, like the Highland Trail 550? That was kind of a race. Um, whereas if you're just doing a casual ride, you can actually s- stop through towns and restock and everything. Uh, or or are you stopping through towns for both of those events? Uh, it's, it's, always, it's always both. Um, so if it's a social ride, you're, you're more likely to stop at a cafe and have a coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're more likely to stop and you know take a few pictures and or have a sit down on on some uh, a field or something. Um, when you're um, on the likes of the Highland Trail uh, or other indiv- any other individual time trials or group starts or anything, whenever you go through a town, it's usually a bit of a grab and dash. You know, there's a bit more of um, an urgency to things. You know, if you like stopping, you like. Before you come to a stop, you're trying to figure out what you want to buy and what else you need to do at the same time. Because there's no, you know, there's a lot of time wasted by going in, getting your your resupply, and then coming out and then looking for, you know, your iPod or looking to see where you, your multi tool is. You can do stuff on the bike whilst you're coming to a stop. So there's a bit more urgency when you're doing the likes of like the Highland Trail or whatever. Um, than there is when you're out with friends because when you're with friends like getting even through gates you know that's you ride up to a gate, you stop, you get off open the gate, a few people ride through you close the gate, you have a chat about the hill that you've just ridden up, you ride along a bit more, come up to another gate repeat and then there's a lot of faff time which is nice when you're in a social um, when you're on a social ride but when you're doing an event, all of that seems to be a lot quicker because you're on your own usually. Mm. You know, you, you ride it as self-supported, so you're on your own and you can get through a gate quicker and, you know, you know, search through your food bag for a Kit Kat or whatever chocolate bar you want and then slam the gate closed whilst you're ripping it open with your mouth. You know, there's a bit of multitasking that you need to do. So, um, But, yeah, you go through towns and resupply uh, as and when, really. I gotcha. So, so for people who don't know, can you maybe explain what the Highland Trail 550 is? Kind of the, you know, what makes it unique, what makes it challenging, and how you decided to do it and get signed up for it. Because my understanding is it's like invite only. You you register for it and you actually have to get accepted to be able to compete yeah. in this event. Yeah, that's that that's exactly right. So, um, the reason why you've got to um register for uh, for it like you got to show your interest and show your background um is one of the things that makes it unique you've you've almost got to qualify for it you've got to either have done big rides like off your own back you know like a 600k or whatever or you know 200k day rides along with a few other things thrown in like a, a mountain climbing or something or and a, an actual route that um, the chap who designed this race, Alan Goldsmith, he um, has made the Cairngorms loop, and he's also made the Lakeland 200, which is in um, in the Lake District. So it's 200 kilometers, about 7,000 meters, 
of climbing. Um, there's a lot of metrics getting mixed up here because depending on what what route is um, made by who, it depends what it's called. So yeah, the 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 measurements are always mixing up. But that is um, a forty hour cut off time. So if you can do that in sub forty hours, so from the st- the second you press go on your computer to the second that you get back to the start and press stop, that is the whole time. So you could ride for it all, or you could ride a little bit, sleep a lot, and then you know ride a lot faster at the end. And as long as that forty hours is met, that's one of the sort of um, stepping stones into the Highland Trail. So it's 550 miles um, that starts in uh, Highlands and uh, Tindrum, which is just south of Glencoe, which is like the 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 start of the the real Highlands. Basically, um, you ride from Tindrum all the way up to the most northerly point of the route, which is the Baylac Horn, uh, which is on the route uh my computer was in kilometers so it was like 417k in which is whatever it is in miles so it's like the furthest away and then all the way back down again on the west coast it's it's beautiful but because it's it's scotland it's actually snowing there right now <laughs> like last week it was nice weather the week before it was 20 degrees and i had friends who done it and oh. only had a, a raincoat on for 30 minutes and they're putting sun cream on i have a nice cream it's 16,000 meters of climbing. So al- almost to Everest. And it's not wow. all, it's not all riding your bike. It's, a, there's a lot of hiker bike. There's a lot of climbing up a mountain and dragging your bike up with you. There's it, even the descents will stop some of the most proficient mountain bikers from riding down. You have to climb down the other side a lot of the time as well. So that, that's what, that's what makes it pretty unique so the route anyone can ride at any time but if you want to start on the grander part you do have to qualify for it in in some in some way yeah and you said that the it's snowing right now the something about uh the uk is it's always raining or snowing or something so i don't know if you had any wild like weather you had to go through but i would imagine that it was wet and dry throughout the whole thing yeah, it was, it, it was sun cream some days. It was four layers and a raincoat with your hood up. Um, there was a weather warning for thunderstorms. Um, we didn't, I didn't ride through the thunderstorms, uh, but I did ride through torrential rain, thick fog, big puddles, and then everything was soaking wet. So when you get into your tent, the tent gets wet. You put the you know, you dry stuff on that gets wet, your sleeping bag gets wet, and you put it all the way wet, and then you do it again the next day, and everything's soaking wet. But then, you know, it gets better. Everything gets dry at some point, so <laughs> you just have to hope for a nice day for it to dry out everything. <laughs> I, I'm not so familiar with that area. I've I've always wanted to go visit, but I've never gone. Is is all of that like uh Govern or government owned property where you can just camp wherever you want and just throw up your sleeping bag um so Scotland has like the open access um okay. and it also has like you can camp pretty much anywhere That's um, awesome. you just gotta leave no trace, set no fires, you know don't leave any rubbish you know just just don't be horrible, basically you know you can camp right. anywhere. Uh, there is some camping management zones which are usually through the, like the touristy parts or like through uh, villages that have had like maybe too too many wild campers there and you then have to buy a permit or you're just not allowed to but it's all um all big estates there's a few estates i'm not sure how many estates but in this uh, the estate could go on for miles absolutely miles like 10 15 20 miles of this massive estate of mountains where they just sort of um you know hunt deer and do whatever they need to do um but but, in the in their own estate that they own so you can pretty much chuck your tent up and you're you're pretty good that's why i like scotland so much you know it's just you're never gonna have a bother with camping anywhere really yeah we did a we did a big truck camping trip before we had kids and we always looked on the the Bureau 
Bureau of Land Management, pretty much free campsites. Yeah. The BLM, so you're like, yeah, yeah. Yep. Searching for where you can. You know, I'd be driving, yeah. she'd be trying to find a, a spot for us to camp and it was absolutely awesome uh, because we would end up in the most ridiculous camping spots. Like one of the coolest spots <laughs> was camping on the rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, and what? yeah, you had to have like a truck to get through there. And, and yeah, I mean, I saw some of your photos on your page. I Scotland looks absolutely gorgeous. So like the places you're camping, I'm sure were just breathtaking. A lot of them were, uh, I mean, what, one of my nights, it was a bus stop at the side of an A road. <laughs> um, <laughs> I put in a 19 and a half hour day and I, I, I was going to sleep anywhere. So <laughs> I, I, I was a bit annoyed that I was in the most beautiful part of the, the country and I slept in a bus stop, but usually the, the camp spots are absolutely phenomenal. But yeah, there's no land management here and there's no sort of, you know, there's, all, there's some private areas, like, but not as bad as you guys anyway. That's great. Do you want to walk us through, you know, just a summary of, of how those five days went? How, how long did it take you to finish this event? Uh, so total time was seven days, uh, seven 10 days, hours okay. and 47 minutes. Yeah. So not the quickest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's somebody won it in just over three and a bit days and he had like no kit on his bike oh, and he my was, God. Yeah, he's uh, uh, Alex McCormack. He he was he's such an incredible rider. Some young gun just absolutely smashed it, and he was like nuts. But yeah, the 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 first um, the first day for me, I, I really wanted to get to a major resupply um, up in Fort Augustus, which is like 155 ish, 155 k in something like that. Um, so. There was one last pass. It's called Coriaric Pass, and it's um, it takes you up to about two thousand feet or whatever it is. It does take you up a long, long way. And I, I got to that point, and I was feeling sick, um, <laughs> which can sometimes happen. Um, like I get hungry, but sometimes it skips hunger and goes straight to feeling sick. And then I start thinking that I'm actually not well. Realistically, I just need to eat food. <laughs> Um, so we ended up staying, um, like a few of us, like I, I decided to stop in this bothy, which is, um, it's like an, an old shepherd's hut basically that has been taken over and done up with the permission of the owner. So it's usually the owner is the, the, um, the estate owner has all of this land and all of the buildings on it. So they, they grant the mountain bothy association, um, you know, permission to look after the building. So it's in their interest to keep the building up on on, it, on its on all walls. But it's used as like a refuge hut, basically. And um, mm. I was like, I'm going to go in. I'll, I'll just work it out because I was feeling pretty hard on myself because I couldn't get to Fort Augustus by resupply because I, um, I wanted a pizza. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That was your motivation some, some, for that first day, it wasn't was, it? It it was it was, but I, ne I never got it. No, <laughs> uh, but there was a fire on, and um, I had dehydrated food. And then uh, as soon as I ate some food, it was um, it was I was good to I was good to sleep then. So second day, I uh, made um, Fort Augustus, so I had breakfast instead of pizza. <laughs> and then um, that next day um, takes you all the way up to um, the next. Um, part which was um oikul bridge uh which is uh, a major resupply I'm trying to remember it's like it's, it's so so soon since it's just happened and it's uh it's all sort of merging into one already it's really strange um the set the second part of the route takes you up to um oikul bridge uh which is um one of the Oh, sorry, no. The second day takes you up to Contin. Sorry, I've missed an entire, entire bit. Um, Contin was another uh, small town, which is little resupply. Um, but I got there really late. Got there like half ten. So it's only it's only a small little village. Uh, so everything was closed. And I just basically threw my tent up next to the A road. It was pouring down with rain. I just wasn't wasn't having. I, I didn't want to carry on in that. And there's a few people that sort of stopped and put the tents up in that and I'm like, yeah, I'm just staying here. I had breakfast in Canton and then the next day is like leading up right to the, the most northerly point. So um, that goes past the Oikel Bridge Hotel 
again, more food. <laughs> and um, takes you down one of the most spectacular glens I've ever been in, um, called Glen Golly. This um, is very, very slightly downhill after a bit of a climb. It was very, very slightly downhill, but a bit of a tailwind. It was like plenty of rain. Well, the, the Scottish call it mizzle, which is just mist and you know rain, so make it uh, make it drizzly, um, getting soaking wet, and then um, it leads onto the Baylac Horn, which is like the probably the biggest part of the route in in my opinion because it's so jaw droppingly beautiful. Um, but it's a hike, a bike, and a half. So you go up to go right down to the bottom to go right up again. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I camped just before that last push-up. So day day three, see me from there. Uh, it led me around uh, towards, um, I think it was heading towards all the... Uh, I, I'm going to have to check now. <laughs> like I say, it's... <laughs> It's a, it's all merged into one. Um, but yeah, the next the next day sort of led us uh, led me around to um, back towards Oikel Bridge because we um, I wanted to get to Loch Inver for the pies. I've heard that the pies in the pie shop are absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, it turned, it turned out that I missed that altogether. <laughs> Um, I'm just I'm sensing then, a theme here. Like you, your the food was your motivation to to get you through each day. Basically, yeah. There's a there's a, a lot of people joke that I do I do like to eat uh, a lot of food, and yeah, I do. <laughs> but yeah, it was um, lead, leading on from there. It's like when when I finally closed the the top loop um, uh, from Michael Bridge, I was just so relieved that that northern loop was done because that was one of the most um it's probably one of the more scarier loops because i'd never done it before and i know that it was a lot of hiker bike in it um more more than a more than i'd ever anticipated to be honest there was a lot of walking um but yeah the, it it takes you across um from a, a bothy that i stayed at before oikel bridge um sue like bothy um it's like a I think it took me about three or four hours to push my bike over the the Ledmore Traverse, which is just a bouldery mess. Uh, it, it'd be great for walking, you know, and taking your bike for a drive. It's not so good. You, you get like three pedal revolutions, and then you're off the bike, and then you you're pushing the bike over bogs. And some some of the track is actually quite hard to see. So when you when you actually get onto the the tarmac to roll down to like I say, closing that that loop at Oikel Bridge. Uh, t- a slight tailwind, slight downhill again. It was just like it was just a dream. Um, hmm. And then going going on from there, leads lead around um, back to the west coast again, which is just it's one of my most favourite parts of um, Scotland. To be fair, so I've I've ridden the um, the North Coast Five Hundred, which goes right away around uh, right the way around Scotland. But I've done that on a road bike um, back in twenty seventeen. Uh, it took six days. Uh, I, I had a, a seventh day, which was a rest day, but it, it took six days, and each day was between six and nine hours of riding, so not really that hard in the grand scheme of things uh, if you're comparing it to this. But once I got onto the West Coast, it was just just absolutely beautiful. It was really nice. And I was heading towards um, a place called Ola Pool then, which was probably... Uh, is it day four? Day four. Yeah, it's either day four or day five. Um, when I got to Ullapool, um massive free supply. You know, it was uh, fish and chips and burgers or whatever you want, and then um, stuff your bags full of food, and then off you go again into Fisherfield. Um, Fisherfield Forest um, is like the most remote place in uh, in. I think in the whole of the UK, it's about twelve or fourteen miles away from I think from a main road from any road actually, but it's not like a simple sort of you know one hour bike ride because you've got to push your bike over more stones, more bogs, up mountains, and it's hours upon hours away from any anywhere whatsoever. Um, and then after after you make it through Fisherfield, if you make it through Fisherfield. 
Um, I was watching somebody on YouTube, and they said that basically, if you get if you get through Fisher Field, I think it was Annie Annie Lee's um, video on the um, uh, Ladies Highland Trail last year. She said if you get to through Fisher Field, you're pretty much guaranteed to make it. And that's all I was thinking about. I was like, I need to get through it so I can be pretty much guaranteed to make it. And um, yeah, one, once once uh, once I got through, um, it was it was a uh, was a weight lifted to be fair. <laughs> Uh, and then the rest of the route was, I'm already compressing the distances and I'm already making it a lot nicer in my head than it was. Um, because you're riding on the Caledonian Canal, that's nice and smooth and flat. It's after the detour, that's a bit lumpy. Um, that was the night that I rode until like half two in the morning and slept in a bus stop uh, in a place called Dorney. Because the day after that, the, the hiker bike up Glen, Glen Affric, um, I, I've I've never climbed anything with my bike as steep or as long or as hard to get up as that. That was that was a real test. That was, and then the rest of it was just relatively plain sailing. After um, you know, having a bit of a bit of a sleep at at Loch Lochy, and which is uh, <laughs> really nice. It's basically like Lakey. <laughs> so Loch Lochy in Scotland is um, it's a really nice place actually. Um. And then onwards from there, it's just back to the start again. And yeah, <laughs> seven days and 10 hours of compressed information. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there like an actual finish line, like a group or anything for this thing? Because you kind of start on your own, right? There's there's no like opening ceremony or, or finish. Um, I mean, there's no opening ceremony um, apart from the race director either rides it. This year he couldn't ride it. He's been bitten by okay. a dog, so he didn't fancy getting the wounds all ripped open again and full of oh, bog and stuff. Yeah, so he, he set us all off. He, he usually sets people off. Um, if there's any warnings, like, you know, watch the rivers, if the rivers are high or, you know, have fun or whatever. Um, we all set off together, so all the top guns, you know, all the races, like the 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 ones that are competing to get, you know, a win or in the top five or three, you know, they all set off, and then you don't see them again; they're just gone. <laughs> and then we all ride together. But there is a, an official start and official finish line as well. Um, it's just a little bit further up than where it used to be now. But you basically go past past the little shop <laughs> and then past the little graveyard. And then the second it goes on to gravel, that's it. You're 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 off. And there's like a virtual line just on the floor, and it's like that's the start line, that's the finish line. So yeah, it, it's pretty much when you finish, there may be nobody there because you might finish at three o'clock in the morning. Um, but luckily, I finished in the evening, and uh, my friend Dawn was at the end. I couldn't believe it. I was made up to see somebody that I knew, and then Alan Goldsmith, the race director, came around the corner. I was just like, oh, there's people here. It's so weird. But usually you finish something like that and there's there's no one. <laughs> You're just like, right, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, was, that that's what was kind of going through my head. How, uh, I don't know, like, you just complete this monumental thing and everyone's like, uh, nobody knows what I just did. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's great. You got like a little bit of a celebration with a friend and the, the guy who set the thing up. Um, yeah, that's it, that's awesome. Cool. Are you still uh, are you still buzzing from from that completion? Because this was what two weeks ago. No, it was, uh, I finished on um, uh, Saturday, just gone. So we're on Thursday okay. now. Um, so yeah, I'm still on a complete high. <laughs> it's uh, I, I'm still like telling people that I've told everything about it. I'm like, oh, there, there was this bit. I'm like, yeah, you said that. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I'm 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 still on such a high, and like I say, it, it wasn't the quickest. But I I set out to complete it, and I've done it, and I'm well happy about it. So I'm like literally telling anybody that will listen. <laughs> did you know sense. any other people? Did you know any other people that were doing the race? Like, if, did you get a chance to reflect with other other competitors at all? I did actually, yeah. So um, I seen a few friendly faces at the start. Um, my buddy actually turned up a few days before as well, so we had a little bit of a spin out with my other friends. So um, me, Alex, and Lars all, all went for a little bit of a bike ride up, up the glen and then back again. So super gentle, 
Um, so we had, I was like, you know, have you got any hints and tips for a, a newbie? Because they're root veterans. They've done it before. But like, oh, I just take it day by day. And that was hard to get in my head to take it day by day. It was, it's 550 miles. It's, it's, a, it's a big old distance. I couldn't make it into a day by day. Eventually, I got it into a day by day and then turned the day into shifts. So I had like a, three shifts in the day. So the, the first part of the day was just horrible. And the second part of the day was like getting the distance. And the third part of the day was just like putting the ribbon on it, basically. So when we, when I got back and I was chatting with them, I was like, yeah, he told me to take it that way. They had done that. And then told them that how I broke it down. And we were just talking about different parts of the route and like their, their adventures on it. Like, um, yeah, it, it was nice to reflect uh, over a beer. And you, the, usually when you finish these things, you get nothing whatsoever. You might get a badge you know at most um but if you completed it this year and um, the real food cafe in tindrum said you can have fish and chips on the house and because obviously i'm quite driven by food i was like i want that fish and chips so yeah i, I devoured my fish and chips and reflected it with, with people that were quicker than me and it looked a lot fresher than me and um yeah it was it was really really nice to have that conversation at the end rather than just being sat alone <laughs> that's that's wonderful uh this might be a good transition to talk about just the bikepacking community in general like i think you got a decent you know decent youtube following and you were saying in this pre-call that you talk to a lot of people around the world for that are trying to get into bikepacking and it seems like there's a quite a solid presence of bikepackers in in the uk like do you have a lot of friends that do this i guess anything you want to share about the the community at large um yeah i'm I'm actually i'm really lucky to have all the friends i've got to be honest i mean i i came back to a whatsapp group chat that had 800 messages in it uh all about the all about the ride itself so i've i've got like all of those guys that were like um that i you know classes of really good friends we've got friends that uh in different circles but still within the bikepacking community and what i really like about it is if i bring uh, a group of people together like two groups of friends um they all get on together really well because we're all sort of with each other for the same thing and we've got all the same interest we're like we just get on really well so it's it, it does genuinely feel like a, a community and when i get a, a message from somebody from like south korea on my instagram saying hey you know your pictures are amazing where where's this from i'm from south korea you know i do bike packing and i look on the profile and i'm like actually yeah it's a real person they're really bike packing <laughs> it's so so cool um i mean it, it it all comes um a lot of this sort of my friend groups comes from the community of um the the people that organize the bare bones 200 which is bare bones bike packing and they've got a forum on there that um, people are always like, you know, selling stuff on or they're like talking about different routes that they're doing or, you know, they, they need a friend to come and do this with them. And that community spirit sort of came from, for me, came from there because a lot of my friends came from that forum, from the events that uh, that Stuart Wright does with Bare Bones Bike Packing and uh, likes of uh, Gen Ride, uh, Rich Monroe, who organizes Gen Rides up in the lakes, you know, every time you go somewhere on an event or a trip or a race you come back with new friends and new phone numbers in your phone and it really it really is a huge community it's it's amazing it's so so nice i love that it's it's always like if you find a commonality i don't remember what what podcast it was but you if you're always working towards a common goal whether it's a hobby you know, a sport or whatever, it's just you immediately connect with those people because yeah. you have something you're so deeply passionate about and that typically reflects into everything. Like, I would imagine that you even get along with most of those people on political crap because you're, you're like so aligned in this, this common interest of bike packing. And it just like, yeah. it, it spans out to, into like every other element of your life. Um, that's cool. That's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, you mentioned this, this bare bones, uh, event. 
I think yeah. of all the events you've done, aside from the Highland Trail, this one sounded the most interesting, at least from what you've shared with me. <laughs> Can you give the listeners a little like introduction of what this Bare Bones event is and how many times you've done it? Yeah, so um, Stuart, uh, Stuart Wright from Bare Bones, every October does um, a 200-kilometer race, individual time trial, basically. and there's other events around bare bones you've you've got the um, you've got the winter event which is to get everybody out and in usually terrible weather <laughs> in in january just after christmas so you know it kicks off the year on a positive spin and there's usually like uh, tea and toaster and you know it's like a real sort of social sort of thing and it's never really big miles or anything um then there's one midway throughout the year uh, called the welsh ride thing um that is a grid reference based adventure so uh stuart will send out like a load of grid references that you can make a route up that will take in these grid references like point so it's like points of interest or an open field with nothing in it you know it's it, it's just to create some sort of adventure and then he does um the the 200 route um which uh is usually it can be nice it can be absolutely atrocious as well so i've done four of them now uh the first one um the 200k that i've done um a road right through and it took like 29 and a half hours elapsed time and i hadn't had a sleep in that amount of time because i was really pushing myself to i, I really wanted to finish sub 24 hours because you get a black badge then and the black badge looks cool <laughs> um i've only ever gotten green which is like sub 30 something hours i think it is um and then the next one um i couldn't complete it's 40 mile an hour winds and rain and it was a different route so every single year it's a different route so you can't learn anything and he doesn't tell you what the route is until maybe two weeks before so you've got no way you've got this mental block of not knowing where you're going because i know mid wales quite well for the amount of riding that i've done there so that's not good because you're like oh is he going to take us over this or am i going to go through this or that um and then I, I completed the next one um i slept in another bus stop then there's <laughs> a bit of a theme there <laughs> i slept in another bus stop for a few hours and shivered and pretended to sleep and finished again just under 30 hours and the last one that i attempted to do um in, last year was coined like that it was was basically noted as the the hardest one that he's done since 2014 um there's a place called strata florida um just those two words would make a lot of my friends cringe it was like it's a it's a four by four track and it's 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 usually quite waterlogged so when when the the trucks are driving down these tracks like the the land rovers with you know the big tires and jacked up suspension and stuff they lose the bonnet underneath and they got snorkels on, you know, like to get through it. And that was the way the route went. So it was quite funny to start off with like, oh, my feet are getting a bit wet. And then I was like, I'm actually riding through and my knees are getting wet whilst I'm on my bike. And then I was like, okay, now my thighs are getting wet whilst I'm riding on my bike. I probably need to get off and do something. Um, yeah, I completely failed at that. I started feeling sick, which is that, that hunger thing, which, um, it's taken me about six months to figure out that it's, it's only hunger. But I, I was really dizzy as well. And then I was close to feeling, you know, like I wanted to throw up and it was really hot. So I don't know whether if it was just hunger and that one, but that was the hardest one. And I, I ended up just camp, sleeping in a bivy bag. I didn't, um, set my alarm. I had seven hours straight sleep. And then I was like, I know my way back through a nice little valley. I'll just ride back to the start because I'm done with this route. <laughs> it is absolutely brutal. Um, yeah, the, it, it, it it changes every year as well. So this year, it's likely to be just as bad. But who knows? <laughs> there's a there's a couple. There's a guy who does like ultra marathons that I've recently discovered, and and he does something similar. He makes these events that have like a little twist in them, or they're they're unique every single year, and uh, it's just so wild to hear that that there's people doing that with the bike packing industry, or like the bike packing sport, and 
I'm yeah. sure <laughs> I'm sure there's stuff everywhere, canoes and whatnot, and it's just like a, a fascinating element to to these competitive events. What what can you put the mind through and body through to push yourself? <laughs> yeah, absolute terror. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and even like, I mean, you you said it before, call, but you did a 550 mile race, the Highland Trail, and like, yeah, this 200 mile one kicked your ass way more than kilometer. that. 200 <laughs> kilometers. Yeah, it's, it's weird. 200 like, kilometers. It's, UK, know, United States, like, but yeah. it's it, it depends on who's made the events as to what they call it. So otherwise, it'd be it'd be the BB one three six for the miles. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, <laughs> the one three six was. I couldn't even finish that, but I've done the Highland Trail, so it goes, <laughs> goes to show. <laughs> That's wild. Um, yeah, so I like to always give people time to just tell some stories. So either in the in the events you just mentioned or any other ones, do any good stories come to mind that, that are, you know, maybe brutal, but kind of funny funny now that you've completed them? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to, um, I tend to hallucinate somewhat. So after a certain amount of time of riding your bike, there's only so much that your brain stays with you, and then it'll start tricking you. Um, I know that uh, when I, when I've done um, Gen Ride in in one go the first time, so that was the uh, hundred and uh, thirty miles, was it? something like that i can't remember but when i've done that um in one go to start off i i seen um a dead woman she was like like over this wall sort of like just draped over the wall like blonde hair and she was just dead by the time i got up to it, it was just a twig you know i seen mr potato head on the floor that was just a rock um yeah and it, it I also had on the Highland Trail a, a few sleep monsters that come come out for me just in the corner of my eye. Every so often I could see this shape and it was this witch and she had this long nose and long like long fingers with nails on it. And I was like, ah, oh, she's not there. So yeah, it's uh, that, that's probably the, the weirdest side of it. And then you got the, the, the other side of it where you like have these interactions where people were, you know, you're you're, you're, um, you're looking pretty decrepit. You're on the floor, and you might be eating something, and you're covered in whatever you've been riding to. And like they have a little interaction with you, and you, you tell they tell you about their adventure that they're going on, um, and you have this like sort of connection. And it's really nice. So it's it, it's cool to 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 have like both extremes, and you never know what's going to happen. You never know who you're going to end up talking to either. Well, I I, re- I really like that side of it. So yeah, I mean, yeah, that's why I like to talk to. That's why I'm excited to talk to you because I this is not something I've done, but just like hearing about what you put yourself through, what you've accomplished with some of these rides, I just think it's totally fascinating. And uh, it's I I didn't know if like I know in running people hallucinate when they're going real strong. I wasn't yeah. sure if that was a thing that was common with biking and or not, but I would have to imagine. So you're you're literally running your body on E for multiple days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's a strange it's a strange feeling. <laughs> you you kind of think you get away with it, and then before you know it, you're like, oh, I've been hallucinating for quite a while now. <laughs> <laughs> it's odd. Oh man. <laughs> Well, man, Alan, this is this is great. Is there is there any last minute things you want to say? Any shout outs you want to give before uh, before we shut this down? Yeah, I think I think I really need to thank my wife. <laughs> so I think without her, I wouldn't be where I am now, doing what I'm doing. Um, I realize that 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 takes a lot of time <laughs> off us, and yeah, she's an absolute rock. You know, I love her to bit. She's absolutely amazing. So yeah. I've got to thank her and all my friends as well. You know, they're they're amazing. Like that, a lot of people that I've I've dragged out on big bike rides. Some of them are really strong riders, and they're like, "Why are we going out in the rain?" I'm like, "Oh, I've got a train." They're like, "Okay, then." So, yeah, I've got really good friends uh, all around. So, big shout out to them. And then also, I've uh, just been um, accepted as a brand uh, brand ambassador for H Pack Bags. 
which is a, a bike packing brand that I've actually been using since 2019, something like that. Um, so for them to now support me, my silly endeavors <laughs> and adventures, you know, that's pretty cool. So big shout out to Ace Pack Bikes like as well. So yeah, all good. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'll I'll leave uh I'll leave links to your YouTube channel and your Instagram page. Everyone cool. go check it out. You got some great footage of some of the rides you've done, either for social rides or competitive or whatnot. Like I was I was pretty impressed by some of the edits you've done and and everything on there. So I'll definitely leave links so people can check that out. But otherwise, uh hope you had fun. Thanks for coming on, Ellen. Thank you for listening to the High Quality Fun Podcast. If you guys enjoyed this show, please give us a follow. And if you have a good story or just want to say hi, feel free to reach out to us on Instagram or YouTube. Thanks for listening.